Luke chapter 6. Now, I've got two titles for this message. Amen? <laughs> the more spiritual title is Foundation of the Righteous. And the more um, Where the Rubber Meets the Road title is Strong in the Storm. Amen? So you can choose. <laughs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. But let's read a few verses of Scripture. And, um, and go from there. Luke chapter 6, read it from verse 4 to 4. And you always need to hear the word of God for yourself. Not for the person that is that should have been here that is not. Amen? For every tree is known by his own fruit. For of thorns men do not gather figs. Nor of a bramble bush gather their grapes. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart, of his heart, of his heart, bring it forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, bring it forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, or the Amplified says, of the abundance of overflow of the heart heart his mouth speaketh and why call ye me Lord Lord and do not the things which I say whosoever cometh to me and heareth my sayings and doeth them I will show you to whom he is like he is like a man which built a house and dig deep, dig deep, and laid the foundation, the foundation, on a rock. And when the flood arose, the streams beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. When the flood arose and the amplified, I mean the Matthew's version in Matthew 7.25 calls it the rain, the flood, and the wind. You get rain, flood, and wind, and you put it all together, and you have got a storm. So it says, the flood, the stream beat vehemently upon that house and could not shake it. For it was founded upon a rock. Could not shake it because of the foundation. But he that hear it and do it not is like a man that without a foundation built a house upon the earth. Against which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Now, I'm going to pull some stuff out of this passage and then I'm going to go on in some other places. But there's a couple of key words here. Heart, foundation, rock, which we're not going to deal with too much, and of course the storm. But there was a house that collapsed. And there is a house that did not collapse. The same storm came against both houses. Now, why did one house survive and the next house didn't survive? Or rather, was it because of the storm that a house that collapsed collapsed? Was it because of the storm? That caused the one house to collapse. If it is totally because of the storm, then the next house should have also collapsed because they both experienced the storm. When we look at it closely, the reason one house collapsed and the next house didn't collapse was not because of the storm or the tests or the trials or the problems or the challenges, 
but it was because of not having a solid foundation that was built upon the rock. What was underneath the house? What was the house sitting on? Now, we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And we are his house. You are righteous. But the Bible says in Psalms 11 and in verse 2 and 3, well, verse 3 says, if the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? But let me read verse 2. It says, for lo, this is Psalms 11, Psalm 11 and verse 2. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. How many of you know the devil is wicked? And how many of you know that he likes to, shoot, to, to fire fiery darts at you? How many of you know the thief cometh but to steal, kill, and destroy? And he looks to see whom he may devour. The wicked bend their bow and they make their arrow upon the string that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. Are you the upright? Say, I am the upright. Say, I am the just. Say, I am the righteous. I am a house that Jesus has built. Amen? The Bible says, whose house are ye? So you are the righteous. You are the upright. So they come and they shoot at the upright in heart. Now, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? If there isn't a proper foundation, what can the righteous do? Now, going back to Luke chapter 6, Jesus started off talking about a heart and then he gave this story. He began talking about a heart and, 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 and the fruit and the kind of tree and so on and so forth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then he said in verse 4 to 6, How can ye, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Now I know on the surface we talk about the doing of the word of God, and we need to look at that. Yes, we do. But I want us to see more than that. I want us to see what it takes to have a solid foundation. I want us to see what is necessary for you and I to be strong in the storm. Because the Bible says storms are going to come. Amen? And um, it says, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Now let's hear, let's, let's, don't, don't read this passage from a, from a um, condemning perspective. Like don't read this passage, you know, from the sense that, why call me Lord, Lord, and, uh, you know, depart from me, you workers in equities, you're going to go to hell. Don't read it from that perspective. Read it from this perspective. Why call you me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Now here is a hint. Malachi chapter 1 verse 6, you don't need to turn to it. It says, if I be your master, where is my fear? If I be your father, where is my honor? And if I be your master, if I be your Lord, where is my fear? So here he says, why call you me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? That indicates to me that a clue is the fear of the Lord. In other words, if you're going to call me master, then you need to fear me. You need to reverence me. You need to hold me in high esteem. And then out of that fear and that reverence for me, you obey me. So that's the key. And hence, hence you talk about being a doer of the word and so on. Now, this is you about a heart. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to go on two tracks at the same time and try to connect them up. One is the issue of, of the heart and um, being strong in the storm. The, this issue of the heart and your soul being anchored. And at the same time, you becoming established in righteousness and having a solid foundation. Somehow or the other, I'm going to blend those two together. Amen? And because you are so anointed to hear and understand, you're going to be able to put it together really good. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Now, let me 
put this out there. The word heart. Many times when we read the word heart in the Old Testament, many times and in the New, we, 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 we think of spirit. We think about the born again spirit. If you were to study it out very closely, and you, you know, there's, there's Greek and Hebrew and all of that. For instance, the word heart in the Hebrew is the word L-A-B-E. And it is, it, this, is, this is what I'm reading directly from the Strong's Concordance. It is used very widely for feelings, the will, and even the intellect. And likewise, for the center of things. Sometimes you notice you speak about the heart of something. But it is quite often used, it is used widely, widely for feelings, the will, and even the intellect. The Greek word is a word called cardia. And it, and it simply says the thoughts and the feelings. Here is what I want you to, 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 to think, especially in this study and, and in your own study. Is that quite often the word heart, we are talking about soul. Amen? So whereas your spirit man is all fine, and, and, and your spirit man um, is filled with righteousness and holiness and the fruits of the spirit, your heart or slash your soul needs some work. The Bible says in James 1 verse 21, Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. Which is able to save your souls. Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinketh, thinketh in his heart. So there is something about heart that has to do with soul and mind and emotions. And, you, and, you, and your memory and, 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 and the place where, um, where, where, in that soul area where the scars of life take place. The place where you experience the frustration, the anger, the bitterness, the resentment, desires, passions. They all come from and reside in that place. Are you with me? No one in another place. Jesus says, out of the heart proceed these things. And then he talk about, you know, all these evil things and thoughts and so on and so forth. That is why it says in Proverbs 4, 23, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's not talking about your spirit. Your spirit has been sealed by the Holy Ghost. Nothing is going to get in there. Amen? Nothing's going to break that seal. Psalms 51, verse 6 says, God says, I desire truth in the inward parts. Amen? And so on. Okay. But you can study that out further. But for this study, I, want, I, want, I need to make that point. Now, as I said, in James 1, 21, it says, basically, that your soul is not, underneath the dom is not automatically under the dominion of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And it's not automatically under the dominion of the Holy Spirit, or your born-again spirit, or the Word of God. But it says, thank God, in Psalms 19 and verse 7, that the Word of the Lord is perfect, and it is able to convert or transform the soul. Ephesians chapter 4, 23 says, you need the whole spirit of your mind renewed. Here is my point. Your soul needs some work. There is a soul problem. Romans 12 verse 2 puts it this way. It says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, so that you might prove and experience what God's good, perfect, and acceptable will. There's a soul problem. Say there's a soul problem. Now, Matthew 10, verse 28. Now, listen to this scripture. It says, Fear not them which can kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather, fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, I understand that hell part of it. But fear him. Now, God... So, uh, it is said that there is, there is about 365 fear not in the Bible. Fear not, fear not, fear not. God tells us over and over again, fear not, fear not, fear not. It does say that we are to fear God, meaning we are to reverence him. But other than that, God says fear not, fear not, fear not. But then here, but then there's another place where he says, um, you know, to, to, to fear less, uh, less a promise being left for you to enter into his rest that you don't enter in. But here, here is, here is what, what is quite interesting. God that tells us fear not 
in this place tells us to fear him which is able to destroy the soul. In other words, you are to fear and, and be very shield and protect your soul and don't allow anyone to paralyze, destroy, or contaminate your soul. Which means, for that reason, the Bible, and the Bible says, no, no, last week we talked about this a little bit, which is offense will come to everyone. Amen? The Bible says offense will come to everyone. Don't be surprised. The issue is when offense comes, you must not allow, you must not feed on it and become offended. Because if you become offended, then you become snared. What do you mean snared? It's the issue of a trap. The bait, you got to put the bait out there where somebody can see it, smell it, and be sucked in by it. And the bait is offense. But once you bite that bait and you, be, and you, you, and you feed on it, then it brings you into the trap that is hidden, which is being offended. And then once you become offended, then you become snared. That's the trap. Are you with me? Now, the Bible teaches that we, for instance, in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 7, how we could be snared by the words of our mouth. The Bible teaches uh, in, in Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25, we don't have time to turn to it, but it talks about the fact about, this, about your soul being snared. Now here's what happened. And here God says, be afraid. Fear him that, can, that has that. Ab Fear him that can destroy or paralyze your soul. In other words, you need to fear. And as it says in another place in Proverbs 29 and verse 20, 25. That the fear of man. The, the fear of man. Let me, let, me, I'm not, let me quote that correctly. Sorry. Proverbs 29 and verse 25. But he that trusted in the Lord. Yeah. Proverbs 29 and verse 25 says, The fear of man bringeth a snare. The fear of man bringeth a snare. You see, for instance, if I allow you somehow or the other to intimidate me, to have some kind of yoke of control over me or anything like that, and if I can allow you to manipulate my emotions or, or play with my mind, or play with even things in my life and play with my memory or play with my soul or if I in any way give you any kind of authority over my soul and you, you, and you misuse it and you snare me, my soul could be snared. I could fall into a trap. I could, uh, uh, the, I could preach on that, but that would take me off track. What that would do, how that would blind you to being able to hear the voice of the Spirit of the Lord and to be led properly by the Spirit of God, etc. But they that trust in the Lord, blessed are he. So the point I'm making is, we need, in other words, even in a husband and wife, even in a marriage relationship, we must, I mean, in a loving, a marriage relationship needs to be loving. It needs not, it must not be one where one person controls or dominate the other, or manipulate them or snare them. Are you with me? God says, beware, don't allow your soul to be destroyed. Amen. There is a soul problem. So he says, guard your heart with all diligence, etc. Now, in Luke here, when it was talking about this heart problem, the go out of the good treasures of a heart, and so on, and bring it forth good, and, a, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, what has been piled up, what is overflowing, what is excessive, if out of the abundance of his soul, out of the abundance, bring it forth. Out of, out of that abundance, he speaks. And if that abundance is negative, if that abundance is, is wrong stuff, he will speak and he will snare his own soul. Proverbs 18, verse 7. Now, I, it's so, I, I feel myself getting bugged down here and I don't want to do that. Right? So let me shift, okay? Let me shift on purpose. The objective is, now, in the meanwhile, let me, in the meanwhile God wants you and I to be in a place where we are never terrified by our enemy. Philippians 1 verse 28. Do you believe God wants you in that place where you are never terrified? Psalms 112 verse 6 and 7, which is a key verse for this particular message, which speaks about the righteous man and the man that favored the Lord, and it says, he is not, his heart is fixed, 
and he trusts in the Lord. And, and, um, and he is not, his heart is established. And he's not afraid of evil tidings. Bad news come, bad reports come, and they don't shake him because his heart is fixed. God wants your heart to be so fixed that no matter what comes your way, you are not moved. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 19 speaks about your soul being anchored by hope, being anchored. You know what happens when a ship is anchored in the midst of a storm and it has a nice big heavy anchor and that, 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 that ship is anchored? And a storm comes and it begins to hit on that ship. The, ship. the ship may rock, but you know something? It's not moving. Why? Because it's anchored. Storms may come against your life, but if we are anchored, God wants your soul to be anchored on the word, anchored in the blood, anchored on, on a new covenant, anchored in righteousness, anchored in the reality of who you are in him, anchored in his promises, so that when the storms come, you might shake a little bit, but you will not be moved. Are you with me? The Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. God wants your soul to be anchored. Amen? So, again, so one of the objectives of this message is to get your soul anchored in Christ. Anchored in a new covenant. Anchored in righteousness. Anchored in the word. And not to be tossed to and fro by the pendulum of, emo of, of negative emotions and so on and so forth. And the circumstances of life. And for you to be established in righteousness. The Bible says in Proverbs, um, Isaiah 54 verse 14, that in righteousness shall they be established. And they shall be far from oppression and so on and torment because they shall not fear. So I'm saying, so the objective is, how do we get our soul anchored in Christ properly? And how do we become established in righteousness and have that solid foundation so that we are not afraid of evil reports and that we have no, and then we even get to the point where we have no fear, period. Are you with me? Excuse me. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Glory to God. All right. Hallelujah. God wants you to be Free. God wants you to stand fast in the liberty. God don't want your heart to be troubled by anything. He says, my peace I live with you. Let not your heart be troubled. No matter what, even though in this world there is tribulation and there's tests and there's trials and there's storms coming, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in me. Believe in Jesus. Believe the word of God. Be anchored. Be properly anchored in the new covenant and in the word of God. Have a hope. A hope that a hope that that proceeds from the very that goes beyond the veil that proceeds from the very presence of God that can anchor your soul. God don't want you to backslide. The Bible says in Psalms 37 and verse 31, God says um, about the law of God being in your heart, and you might not slip, you might not slide, you might not stumble. Do you want to live a life in your Christian life where you don't stumble? It doesn't mean you're not going to have problems. But to not stumble means to not go backwards. It means to continue to make progress. It means to continue to grow, to continue to mature. Amen? Now, Jesus has said in John chapter 16 and verse 1, he says, and we talked about that last week, he says, these things that I said in the last couple of chapters, and I'm still going to say some more, John 16 verse 1, he says, these things have I spoken unto you that you might not, be offended, that you might not stumble. Amen? Because in a couple of hours, Jesus was going to be betrayed and all these things that were going to happen. They were going to see him hanging on the cross. And he says, I'm telling you right up front, there's going to be tribulation in just a couple of hours. But he didn't tell him it was going to be that soon. Amen? Because he had told him that he had told him over 14 times that he was going to die and raise again. Amen? But anyway, he said they're going to be tribulation, they're going to be trouble, but I'm telling you these things so that when they happen, you do not stumble. You are not offended. And, if, and we talked about that last week. If you go back and you see what he said, you will see how if we got a hold of those truths in our lives, we will not be offended. Offense will come, but we must not be offended. But the point is, he don't want you to stumble. 2 Peter 1 verse 10, it says, if we be diligent to make our calling and our election sure, we will not stumble. We will not be barren in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we will not stumble. Amen? God wants you to keep progressing. God don't want you to slip, slide, backslide. God don't want you to be overwhelmed, terrified by the enemy. God don't want you to be dominated by sin. Hallelujah. He wants you to be established in righteousness. He wants you to be in that place where you're not afraid of any kind of bad news whatsoever. Now, as I said, when you are born again, when you are born again, you are righteous. Say, I'm righteous. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore then, being justified or declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God. We have peace with God. You have peace with God. Jesus became sin that you might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. What does your righteousness look like? Jeremiah 23 verse 6 says, The Lord is your righteousness. You are righteous. You are found in him, not having your own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God. Philippians 3 verse 9. Now, here's a wonderful scripture. Psalms 119 verse 142. Well, let me back up. You are made the righteousness of who? God. The righteousness of God in Christ. Amen? You are found in him, not having your own righteousness, but the righteousness which is of God. By faith in Jesus. Psalms 119 verse 142 says that God's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Amen? God's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Now if the righteousness that God has made you is his own righteousness, and you are, you are, you are the righteousness of God, then your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and we could prove that in many, many ways, but we don't have time to go there. But it is an everlasting righteousness. You are as righteous as any other saint, as any other believer. You are as righteous as Jesus. As he is, so are you. And to be righteous means to be able to stand before the Father God without any sense of insecurity, inferiority, to stand before him without any sense of condemnation and judgment against you some evil sentence against you, some impending doom, to be able to stand before his presence and to stand before the enemy with a superiority complex. I've been adding that recently because he's underneath your feet. You need to add that. To stand before the enemy with a superiority complex. <laughs> Hallelujah. But let me emphasize this point again. Your righteousness is as good a righteousness as any other believer. The most, the, 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 the saint that you have in the highest esteem for, your righteousness is just as good as his or, as his or hers. You are, a, the Bible says Jesus is the vine and you are the what? You are the branches. Now, you are as close <laughs> to the vine as any other branch. Think on that. You are as close to the vine as any other branch. And even as every branch is righteous, so are you. The Bible says that he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. You are one with the vine. You are absolutely one with the vine. And that's the very essence of righteousness. This oneness that you have with God in Christ. You are in right standing. The vine, the branch. Divine, you are in, in, in right standing, you are in unbroken fellowship, you are in communion, common union with the vine. There is no insecure, insecurity, there is no inferiority. The same life that is in the vine is in the branch, it's flowing out into the branch. Now, the question is, how do you and I take advantage of this righteousness? How do you and I take advantage of it? Obviously, the answer is by faith. And to live not as mere men, not to live as people who are not born again and people that are not righteous, but how do we take advantage of this righteousness? How do we live and take advantage of the fact that you and I have the divine nature of God in our born-again spirit? That ought to mean something. That ought to give us an edge. <laughs> Shouldn't it? 
Now, as I said, there's a devil that wants to steal, kill, destroy. There's a devil that wants to stop you from being established in the righteousness. There's a devil that wants to hinder you. Now, here is an awesome promise where your righteousness is going to turn. Because you see, all of this righteousness and all of this good stuff that is on the inside, you want to work it out. You want to have it manifest in your life. You want it manifest in your soul. You want a soul that has been out of whack. You want a soul that has, that has lifted up itself. You want a soul to be aligned correctly and accurately with the reality of who you are in Christ, to be aligned with the Word of God. Isn't that right? Now, here is a wonderful promise. Turn with me to Psalms 37. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Glory to God. How do we fix this whole problem? All right. Psalms 37 and verse 6 says, But let me just read from verse. Let's, let me read from verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily you shall be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And, verse 6, he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light. The Amplified says, He will make your uprightness and your right standing with God go forth as the light. What does that mean? I see that as a promise from God. He shall make. He shall bring forth. Well, if it's a promise from God, what is he promising me? He is promising to bring forth your righteousness as the light. The light shines and it can be seen. God is going to cause your righteousness that is on the inside to come to the outside. God is going to cause your righteousness to be made manifest. Can you imagine that? Wouldn't you like that? I mean, all that stuff on the inside, don't you want that to come to the outside? God says, I'll do it. I'll do it. Well, which, is not, which should not be too surprising because after all, he's the one that perfect that which concerns you. He's the one that performed all things for you. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? It is him that is at work within you both to will and to do his good pleasure. And he wants to bring certain things to pass. He didn't abandon, abandon you and leave you alone. The Holy Spirit has been sent to take hold together with us. To, to cause certain things to be made manifest and to cause us to come into the very fullness of our destiny. So God says, I will bring forth your righteousness. I will bring forth your righteousness as the light. Now, that's a good promise. But I want to know, well, okay, what's my part? What do I have to do? So let me back up and see. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Trust in the Lord and do good. Verse 4, delight yourself also in the Lord. Commit your way unto the Lord. Now, the commit your way unto the Lord, we know from 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7, where it says, um, be clothed with humility, and then it says, casting all your care upon him. When we study 1 Peter 5, verse 6 and 7, we conclude that the way, that, that for you to, the way you clothe yourself with humility is, commit, is casting all your cares on the Lord. Amen? All right? To trust him with everything. All right. So this committing your way unto the Lord, is, a, is another way of saying humble yourself. Humble yourself. But what about trust in the Lord, do good, delight yourself in him? Now, the trust part. If we read um, in Psalms 34, Psalms 31, let's flip back there for a moment. Let's, we're going to look at some Psalms there. Psalms 31. I want to know what does, I want to, I want to understand what, I want to know what it's going to take for me to have this solid foundation. I want to know what it's going to take for my soul to be anchored properly. I want to know what it's going to take for God to cause my righteousness to be made manifest. And it tells me that I need to delight myself, I need to do good, and I need to, and I need to um, commit my way unto the Lord. I need to, and I need to trust the Lord. Psalms 31 verse 19 says, Oh, how great is thy goodness! 
which you have laid up for them that fear thee, that you have wrought for them that trust in thee. May I present to you, they that trust the Lord, they that fear the Lord, will trust the Lord. That to trust the Lord, to fear the Lord, is to trust God. Abraham offered up his son. When Abraham said, me and the boy are going to go yonder and worship. And then when he was about to kill the boy, the angel says, don't do it, for now God knows that you fear him. So Abraham, trusting and believing that God was going to provide for himself a lamb, Abraham's trust in God was manifested by his obedience. It was manifested by him, by, by him offering up his son. And, and, and God called that fearing the Lord. The angel says, now God knows that you fear him. In other words, to fear the Lord is to trust the Lord. Look at Psalms 34 for a moment. Let's read a few verses. Psalms 34, not too far. And verse 7. The angel of the Lord encamps around, the, around, around about who? Them that fear him and deliver them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusted in him. Oh, fear the Lord, ye are saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord, they that fear the Lord, seek the Lord, shall not want any good, any good thing. Come here, children, hearken unto me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Please teach me, I want to know. What, is, what, what man is he that desireth life and loveth many days, and that he may see good? Well, I guess those are the benefits of the man that fears the Lord. Well, anyway, teach me to fear the Lord. Keep your tongue from evil. And your lips from speaking guile. Talk right. Talk right. Say talk right. Now you know that one of the things about a righteous man is that he talks right. Because to, to live out your righteousness and to walk out your righteousness, you got to think right, believe right, talk right, act right. Amen? So keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Depart from evil and what? And do good. Wasn't that one of the things? And do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are upon the, are upon the righteous, and his ears are open unto their cry. Now, interest, so we see a description right here that the fear of the Lord is about doing good. The fear of the Lord is about keeping your tongue. And then it goes on to say, after talking about the fear of the Lord, it says in verse 15, the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. And it switched from talking about the fear of the Lord to the righteous. Could it be that the man, that the righteous is the man that feared the Lord? Could it be that the way the righteous operates is by the fear of the Lord? Could it be that the way the righteous man is to act and conduct and think and talk and, and behave and everything else? Could it be that for him to understand how he needs to function, he ought to go talk to the fear of the Lord and find out? Hello? All right. So it says, back in Psalms 37, God says he will establish our righteousness and cause it to be made manifest, but we must trust him, which is the fear of the Lord. We must do good, which is the fear of the Lord, and we must delight ourselves in God. We must delight ourselves in God. Now, what does it mean to delight yourself in the Lord? What does it mean? To delight yourself in the Lord. And, I, and, and this is a word that... If there was a way to exaggerate it, you should. So as to get the impact of it. It says, to delight is to magnify. You know, if you get a magnifying glass, like if the Bible says, magnify the Lord with me. You know, you have a binoculars on it, you can look to one end and it's magnified. You can look to the next end and it gets tiny. Amen? Well, if you could magnify, look at God through a magnifying glass and magnify him. You're not going to make him bigger than he is. But you're going to have a different perspective. Are you with me? So, the, to delight is to magnify. It is to honor. It is to respect highly. It is to highly esteem. It is to treasure. It is to rejoice in. Delight in the Lord. And the, and the Lord is the word. Delight in the word. Delight, rejoice, esteem, highly esteem, treasure, honor. To delight in the Lord and to, uh, and. Matter of fact, hold this thought and let's, let's make a switch here. Turn with me to Psalms 112. Psalms 112. Psalms 112 and verse 1 says, 
Blessed, praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that favored the Lord and delighted greatly in his commandments. Now let's jump down to verse 7 for a moment. Or verse 6. So blessed is the man that feared the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandment. Verse 6 says, surely he shall not be moved. That means he's established. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. Whose heart is fixed? Who is it that is established? Who is it that is not going to be moved? The one, verse 1, the man that feareth the Lord and delighteth greatly in his commandment. Delighted greatly in his commandment. To delight greatly in his commandment, that means the word of God is your joy. It's your treasure. It is, you honor, the, the word of God is so precious to you that the word is your assurance. The word is your insurance. The word is your hope. The word is your confidence. The word is your guarantee. The word is your comfort. The word is your strength. The word is more precious to you than silver and gold. You know, it is more precious to you. It is more valuable than life itself. To highly, to delight greatly in the Lord. It is to magnify the word above all else. Psalms 138 verse 2. Psalms 119. Let me just read a few verses of the scripture. Psalms, Psalms 119 verse and read all of Psalms 119, just to get a, a, a picture of it. Psalms 119, verse 72. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. Your word is better, is better to me, that's the way I see it, than silver and gold. Psalms 1, um, verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. I rejoice at your word. When I find something in the word, when I get a hold of the word, it's like, wow, this is, ex this is it's, it's like a man that just came to the enemy's camp. And the enemy took off and left lots of silver, lots of gold, lots of precious stones. And it's now all yours. Amen? I rejoice more than I would at great spoil. So precious is the word. The Bible says in Psalms 119 and verse 16. How precious is this word? Verse 16 says, I will delight myself in your statues. I will not forget thy word. So this issue of delight, it is so, you treasure it so much, it is so valuable, it is, it is so rich, it is so precious to you, it, it means so much to you that you will not forget it. In other words then, as I delight in the word, to delight in the word, it's, it's always in the forefront of my thinking. Now, this is the man whose heart is established. This is the man who has a solid foundation. This man that greatly delights in the word. Are you with me? And it says in Psalms 112, who is this man that greatly delights in the Lord word? He is the man that fears the Lord. And as I've been saying, to fear the Lord is to delight in the word. It's to delight in the Lord. It is to do good. It is to trust in the Lord. So the fear of the Lord, operating in the fear of the Lord, which delights greatly in the word of God, and the word of God is magnified above all else, that man is the one whose heart become fixed. That man is the one, quite frankly, that the word will also transform his soul. When you can keep it that way before your forefront, in the forefront of your thinking. Amen? Let's look at Psalms 112 some more. All right. And, and um, there, there's, there, there is, no, let, let, let me just paint this picture just a little bit more. Let, let's look at a few verses in Psalms 119. Because you see, this is the relationship you have to have with the word. You see, the, 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 we need to recognize that the word of God is Jesus. Is, is, you see, the, the lordship, the, how much lordship Jesus has in your life is how much lordship the word has in your life. Amen? Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. Jesus said to the disciples, um, um, he says, you, you, where I go, you know. You know the way. They say, we don't know the way. Jesus says, I am the way. Jesus says, if you know me, you know the way. They said, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. He says, if you see me, you see the Father. In other words, Jesus says, I am the way. 
I am the truth. I am the life. I am, you. I am the express image of the Father. The Word is, in other words, your intimacy with the Word is your intimacy with Jesus. The Word is the way. The Word is Jesus. The Word is your relationship with Jesus. Your relationship with the Word is the revelation of your relationship with God the Father. Let us not separate it. You follow me? Psalms 119 and verse, verse 97 says, um, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. 148, mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in the word. I stay up at night. I stay awake. Why? So that I could meditate in the word. 159, consider how I love your precepts and quicken me. Consider how I love your word. Can we say that? Now, if we can say that, then should we be praying and believing God that we would be at that place where we can say, Lord, how I love your word. Consider, Lord, how much I love your word. Your word is more precious to me than silver and gold. When I find and I get a hold of your word, it's more valuable than great spoil. It is more important to me than my necessary food. Lord, how I love your word. It is my med. I greatly delight in your word. Amen. Now we say, bro, our prayer is, Lord, let it be that way. Let it be something that I would meditate in day and night. That I would not forget it. It would be so valuable that I would not push it aside. It says, great peace have they which love thy, thy word. Now, the thing is, how do we become, how do we build this foundation? we already beginning to get the answer. It's a fear of the Lord. It is delighting greatly in the word. But let me just make a, let me just make a, a further connection. I want you to see that the, the, the person that, to walk out your righteousness, you are the righteousness of God on the inside. But for that to become built into your life, for you to live as the person who is righteous, you have to develop and walk in the fear of the Lord. Amen? Let me give you a scripture. Let me give you one scripture first, and then I'm going to track it on in, in, in a different way. Look at um, Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 20. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 20. It says, and it was, it was, it was, okay, back in verse 13, it says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And it's talking about the fear of the Lord. Now, granted, I know in Proverbs chapter 8, it is talking about wisdom. However, do you not know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. No fear of the Lord, no wisdom. So here it says, I, in verse 20, I lead in the way of righteousness. I, wisdom, which comes from the fear of the Lord, lead in the midst of the paths of, of, of leads in the way of righteousness. In other words, the fear of the Lord, how will the fear of the Lord lead you? How does it guide you? It will lead you in the way of righteousness. In other words, if you listen to the fear of the Lord and you obey the fear of the Lord and you let the fear of the Lord and, and the, the, the Lord God unites your heart to fear his name and that fear of the Lord permeates your life and you're walking in the fear of the Lord, you will automatically be living as the person that you are on the inside. You will be living as the righteous. You will start thinking, talking, believing, and acting right. Integrity will become an important thing. That ought to tell you that when, we are talk, that when you're talking about, about being the righteousness of God and even the grace of God, that there is no such thing as, uh, as, a, as they call sloppy grace and all that kind of stuff. That's not the Bible. Amen. You learn to live in grace and you learn to live in righteousness, you will ought. There is no contradiction between the message of righteousness, the truth about righteousness, the truth about grace, and the truth about the fear of the Lord. No contradiction whatsoever. The grace of the Lord teaches us to live soberly and righteously in this present life. Titus 2 and verse 10 and 10 and 11. Amen? All right. Now look at Psalms 112 again. Let's go back to Psalms 112. Psalms 112. What we want to see is, who is this man 
Who is this man that is, whose heart is fixed? Who is he? Verse 1, praise you the Lord. Blessed is the man that feared the Lord. How much Psalms 112? That delighted greatly in his commandment. This man that fears the Lord, that delights greatly in his commandments, his seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright, here it calls him the upright, the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His righteousness endure it forever. Amen? You see what happens with that fear of the Lord? Unto the upright. Again, he's called the upright. There ariseth light in the darkness. He's gracious. He's full of compassion and righteous. The man that fears the Lord, the man that, 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 that is going to be that is going to operate in his righteousness is gracious. He's full of compassion. He lends, he gives. He is merciful. A good man shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart is established. He shall not be afraid. So we see, as you divide this here, you will see that the man that feared the Lord is the righteous man. Amen? Look at, turn with me to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah chapter 26. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 26 and verse 2 says, Open ye the gates that the righteous nation, Amen? That the righteous, I'm going to take out the word nation just for now. That the righteous which keepeth the truth, the righteous which walks in the truth. The righteous that walks in the truth. The truth of what? His righteousness. The truth of the truth is the word of God. That the righteous nation which keepeth the truth. I see that as the righteous man walking in his righteousness. Walking in his righteousness. Here he is. He is righteous. No, he's walking like he's righteous. He's walking in truth. There is truth in his innermost being. He's beginning to walk by that truth. That he keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou will keep him, that righteous man that is walking in his righteousness. That righteous man that is walking in his righteousness and is walking in truth. You will keep him, God will keep him in perfect peace. Perfect wholeness. And his mind, his mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusted in thee. Does that sound like the fear of the Lord? Psalms 119, verse 165 says, you don't have to turn to it, but it says, Great peace have they that love thy law. Great peace, not just a little bit of peace, but great peace do they that love thy law. That is those that delight greatly in the word of God. To love the word, to love the word, to embrace the word. To be yoked together with the word. Jesus put it this way. He says, if you abide in me and my word finds a home in you, my word that is alive and living can come and you can get it engrafted in you and it could be at home in you and it can live in you. The Bible says that when you meditate upon the word day and night, you're going to become like a tree planted. Amen? How? By meditating, by feeding on the word, meditating on the word, continuing to delight in the word, delight in the word greatly. Habitually, 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 continually. What happens? You become like a tree planted. You become established. Amen? Established. You get a solid foundation. It's not easy to root up a tree when it's got deep roots. But how did that come about? It came about, it came about because of meditating in that word. Amen. So God will keep him in perfect peace. So it is about the word. It is about the word. It is about walking in the word. It is about delighting in the word. It is about walking in the fear of the Lord. It, it says in Psalms 119 verse 161, how, how I stand in awe, how I fear and tremble at your word. Amen? Glory to God. Here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a, again, this great peace. Where is it coming from? Where is this great peace coming from? Because you need that peace in the storm, don't you? Amen? The, you don't need to turn to this. Isaiah 32 verse 17 says, The effect of righteousness is peace. 
The effect and the work of righteousness is quietness and full assurance forever. Quietness, full assurance, peace, peace like a river. That's the effect and the work. That's the end. That's the, what, the results that comes from what? Being established and walking in righteousness. Here's another proof about, uh, about the issue of to be established in righteousness is comes by delighting in the word primarily. Here's the verse of scripture you know. You know, you know Isaiah 54 verse 14. Right? That in righteousness shall you be established. And you, um, and you will not be oppressed because you shall not fear, etc. Isaiah 54 verse 13 says, Your children shall be taught of the Lord. Shall be taught of who? Of the Lord. And great shall be their peace. Great peace. Which children? You and I, we are the children of God. We are taught of the Lord, taught by the Holy Ghost, taught by the Word of God. And what happens? Great peace. Great shall be the peace of your children. Great peace have they that love the Lord, that love the Word of God. I will keep them in perfect peace because they trust me, because they fear me, because they're walking in the fear of the Lord. Amen? Now, a couple of, now again, we got to see this, that the righteous and the man that fear the Lord, hey, they're, 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 they're in harmony. The way, the, the way you walk in your righteousness is you walk in the fear of the Lord. Here's a couple of scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 32 says, now I'm going to move very quickly here in these remaining minutes. Proverbs 3 verse 32 says, the forward man is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret is with the righteous. That means his confidential communion and secret counsel. Is with the righteous. The secret. God says, I have, I, 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 I reserve intimacy. I mean, are you going to allow someone to be intimate with you and share your secrets with them if they don't respect you, honor you, trust you? And if they don't, I mean, are you going to allow yourself to be so close with them if, 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 they're, if without relationship? you got to have relationship. You follow me? And that's what Jesus was saying when he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you. He's talking about relationship. When he was saying, if you know me, you'll know the Father. I am the way. He's talking about relationship. And he says relationship is going to cause you to not be offended. That deep, intimate relationship with me. These things have I spoken unto you, telling you that if you know me, you know the Father. These things have I spoken unto you that you might not stumble, that you might not be offended. So here it says, the secret is with the righteous. Now, Psalms 25 verse 14, you don't need to turn to it. It says, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. Here it says, the secret is with the righteous. Psalms 25 14 says, is with them that fear him. Same verse, one says righteous, one says them that fear him. Malachi chapter 3 verse 16, you don't need to turn to it again, but Malachi 3 verse 16 says about, um, there was a book of remembrance that was written about them that fear the Lord because they taught, they taught and they talked often about the Lord and about the name of the Lord. It says that in verse 16. That was, a, that was what was in their mouth. That was their conversation. Talking about the word, talking about the, about the Lord, talking about his goodness con constantly. And then two verses later, verse 18, it says, then you'll be able to go and discern between the righteous and the wicked. Verse 16, cause him to fear, cause him the man that fears the Lord. Verse 18, cause him the righteous. Amen? Psalms 149, verse 19, again, you don't need to turn to it, but Psalms 145, verse 19 says, um, the, uh, God says he will fulfill the desires of them that fear him. Proverbs 10, 24 says he will, the desire of the righteous shall be granted. Proverbs 14, 26 and 27 speaks about the confidence of those that fear the Lord. Proverbs 28, verse 1, the righteous are as bold as a lion. In other words, they're, they're parallel. Amen? Blessed be the name of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the way you walk out this righteousness, is the way you develop in this righteousness. I, I, um, you know, there's just so much we can look at, but time don't allow. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's something else I, need, I have here. Something else here I need to say. 
Job, look at this here. Do you think, do you think God knows? What, what, do you think God can tell us? Yeah, this is good. God wrote this book, you know that? <laughs> Job, turn with me to Job chapter 1. So if any time in the future you hear somebody trying to say to you that somehow the other this message about righteousness denies the issue of holiness and it denies the fear of the Lord, not true. You perfect holiness through the fear of the Lord. The way you come into a consecrated relationship with God is by learning to walk in the fear of the Lord. The way you develop in your righteousness is by learning to walk in the fear of the Lord. Listen to what God says. Job chapter 1 and verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan. Now, by the way, everything in the book of Job is not what God says. Amen. There's a lot of folks talking Job. And God says they were wrong when they said it. That's another lesson. But nevertheless, verse 8 is God speaking. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewed evil? God says that, a, that, that Job was a perfect and an upright man, and God defines an upright man as one that fears him and hates evil. Can you see that? God says, here is what an upright man is. Here is what a righteous man is. A righteous man is one that fears me. And hates evil. Well, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Amen? Amen? Praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't feel like if I'm done, but I need to stop. <laughs> I really don't feel like, sometimes you feel like you're done. But let's stand for a moment. Thank you, Father. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So in the final analysis then, the way, the way you become established in righteousness, there's other things, but the primary, the first and most important is this issue of delighting. And I'm talking about delighting in the word of God. Delighting, making the word of God your delight. And the Bible says when you do that, God says he's going to change your desires and make them conformable to his. And then he'll fulfill them. He will give. You delight yourself in the Lord. You delight yourself in the word. You make the word your delight. You delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The desires of your heart will come from him. Right? And he will fulfill them. He will change what has to be changed. He is able to do that. He is able to bring forth your righteousness as the noonday sun. He wants, he, all that good stuff that is on the inside of you, he wants it to come to the outside. He wants this righteousness to be real. He wants you to be, he wants you to be walking and living and talking and breathing in a manner that is totally one with him. Where your thinking is lined up with him. Where your believing is lined up with him. Where your speaking is lined up with him. Where you are believing right and as a result you are acting right. And where you are continuing to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord. And you are progressing, going forward. No matter what the enemy bring your way, your heart is fixed. And you are trusting in the Lord and you are not moved. You are not moved. None of these things move you. Amen. The Bible says there's a joy and peace that comes from believing. You know, sometimes we think we are believing and sometimes we think we are in faith. But ultimately, if we really are in faith, that according to the word of God, there is a thanksgiving that goes with it automatically. There is a rejoicing that goes with it automatically. There is a joy that comes from believing. Amen? That is why Jesus said, look, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Believe in the Father, believe also in me. What is he saying? He was saying that, look, the first thing you're going to have to do when, 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 when bad things happen, the first thing you're going to have to do is don't be perplexed. Don't be agitated. Grab a hold of emotion and believe. What is he saying? He is saying that if you allow your heart to be troubled and if you allow yourself to be agitated, then you are not in faith. And so the flip side of the coin is don't do that. But believe in me, believe in the Father. In other words, have faith. Trust me. Get a right perspective. 
Lift up your eyes and look. Look ahead. Look at heaven. Look at what's going on. Look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen, the things that are eternal. Otherwise, the situation will be magnified instead of him being magnified. Are you with me? So, and he's saying, have this relationship. Have this relationship with me. Have this relationship with the word where I and my word and my father, we're all one. You see, we don't have Jesus in the flesh. So the way we know him and the way we develop relationship with him is through the word. So he says, don't call me Lord, Lord, and not allow my word to abide in you. Because it's about my word abiding in you that you will be able to, uh, to connect to the rock. Amen? The rock that is greater, the rock that is bigger. It is by connecting it is by the word getting on the inside, living on the inside of us, and transforming and converting our soul, being engrafted in us. That is how we are going to be able to have the soul anchored. So that when a situation looks hopeless, we got a supernatural hope. And the thing about it is, man, we, we always got a final answer. That's so what? If it doesn't work out, I'll just be in heaven. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, so I can't lose. I lose, I win. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You have a perspective like that, and I'm telling you, the devil is going to have a hard time. Amen? Right? Or if the devil come and try to mess with your self-esteem and you say, look, hey, I conquered down my life dear unto myself. All right? That I might finish my course with God. It's not about me. My life is hid with Christ and God. Well, it's the devil come and he's trying to tell you, well, you don't deserve this or you don't deserve it. Hey, hey, it's not about my deserving it. Jesus deserves it. And because he deserves it, it is, I'm, basing my, I'm, I'm, basing, I'm trusting him. He deserves it, and that's the reason why I can stand in confidence with this particular promise. We need to come into that place where we become so Jesus-occupied, so word-preserved. I like that. So permeated with the word of God. Now, does it take effort? Yes, it does. Jesus says to build your house upon the rock, you're going to have to dig deep. You got to dig deep, and it's a daily thing. It's, I don't mean that you got to go about it in a religious manner and you miss a day, you, you know, your word fall apart. No, I don't mean it that way. But there is a consistency. There's a diligence. Amen? The Bible says be diligent to make your calling and election sure so that you might not slip. So that you might not slip. Amen? They that will greatly love the word of God, great will be their peace, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing will cause them to stumble. That's the message. Simple, clear, delight yourself in the word. Amen? Amen. You believe that? Amen. Say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you, and put your hand in your heart. I'm asking you, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Enlarge my heart that I would run the way of your commandment. Increase my appetite. Increase my desire. Increase my hunger that I would delight greatly in your word in the name of Jesus. This is my cry. And your word tells me that when I cry out, I am righteous, you hear me. So I believe you've heard me, and I know it's according to your will. So I believe that this moment, there is something happening on the inside of me to increase my desire, my capacity for you and for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.